Welcome to the Solo PvP Guide for the Tech 1 Tristan. This guide is for Faction Warfare, and it's recommended you stick to the Novice sites in Faction Warfare. You can go into the Smalls, but just be aware if you go into the small sites that you're going to possibly face much stronger opponents in some Destroyers and Tech 2 Frigates. So, what we're going to do in this first part of the video is we're going to talk about the fitting. I'm going to explain what the purpose of everything in the fitting is. I'm going to explain some of the tactics. We're going to look at some of your possible opponents. And we're going to go over some alternatives if you can't fit this. I would say a prerequisite to even flying the ship is being able to use Tech 2 light drones. Ideally, the Warrior 2s. We'll talk more about why I prefer Warrior 2s over Hobgoblins and this setup specifically. A little bit later but make sure you at the very least have tech 2 drones because that's where the majority of your DPS of your damage output will come from you can see here under firepower that we have 95 drone DPS damage output and 49 turret DPS so what that means is that I have twice as much DPS coming damage coming from my drones as I do from my guns and therefore it's much more important to have uh, really good quality drones. You want to have good skills with guns as well. You want to maximize everything on this fit, and you want to get to the point to where you're pretty pretty strong. You want to have stats that look very much like this, and it won't take long if you focus focus in on the skills. So, the name of the ship is Kite Within Scram Range, or Kite Inside Scram Range. It's known as a Scram Kite. The idea here is that we use a tactic called kiting, but we don't do a full kite, which would be a little bit longer distance, out around 18, 20 kilometers. We're doing a scram kite. We're going to be within this 8.3 kilometer range of our scram, our warp scrambler. So what I like to, the way I like to describe kiting to new people, to Eve or to solo PvP, is imagine kiting as two kids in an old movie or TV show. Two kids are having a fight on the playground. And the bigger kid puts his hand on the, the head of the smaller kid, and the smaller kid just sits there throwing punches, but he can't reach the bigger kid, so he can never land any of his punches. That's the way I like to think about kiting. I'm holding you at range where you can't really effectively hurt me. That's kiting. So we're going to go over these modules, and we're going to talk about why I fit them and some possible alternatives. You can see here that the fitting is pretty tight. The, there's not much leftover CPU, there's not much leftover power grid. However, there are a lot of things you can do to work those numbers and move them around to fit for your specific case. So we're going to start here with the damage control. Uh, the damage control is a named damage control. So what that means is you've got tech 1 there, then you've got named, then you've got tech 2. Oftentimes there's more than one named. And I guess you could call these other ones named, but these are the only ones that really matter. Right, You never want to use Tech 1, but you will, in many cases, use the named version. The reason I'm using the named instead of the Tech 2 is, is because of CPU. It saves me 10 CPU to use the named. The Tech 2 is slightly better, but it's more important I save that CPU. I've got a small ancillary armor repair with nanite paste loaded. Now the reason for this is this is your tank. This is what's going to keep you alive throughout the fight. It's important you start early enough because you are going to be going into structure in most of your fights. In any of the really good fights you have, you will be bleeding into structure a bit. And it's important to be running this. Now whenever you're running your AAR, and this goes for ASBs too, Ancillary Shield Boosters, but whenever you're running a small, a, any Ancillary Armor Repair, you want to overload it always. The reason for this is because if you look here at the stats, overloading gives you both both a duration bonus. So it reduces the duration between the armor repair. So basically it hits every, well, let's show it accurately, unoverloaded. All right, okay. So the one on the left is unoverloaded, the one on the right is overloaded. You can see that unoverloaded, it fires every 4.365 seconds. Overloaded, it fires every 3.61 seconds. So if that, that was the only bonus to overloading, then 
it really wouldn't matter that much. But what really matters is that you also get a 10% to armor repair amount when you overload. That means you're getting more bang for your buck, more repair for your cycle. Therefore, it's always in your best interest, no matter what, to be overloading that AAR from the very beginning to the very end. And you're only you're never going to have time to reload it. Once it runs out, it runs out. You might get a cycle or two more, which I suggest you do. You try to get another extra cycle unloaded um, before you turn it off. And that's probably going to be when you're about running out of capacitor. But you can see here, 210.96 versus 222, 222.99. So that's about a 12 extra hit points per cycle. You're going to get... I think it's either eight or nine cycles. You're going to get eight cycles, I believe. So yeah, eight cycles. Um, eight times 12. That's, what, 96 extra hit points. 96 extra hit points. It's worthwhile. All right, so our next thing is our drone damage amplifier. This may be difficult for you to fit early on. Hopefully you can fit it. It's important. It takes two level four skills, but if you can't fit it, you can always go with the named version, which will save you some CPU as well. Let me uh, compare the two. So the named is 17% more damage. The Tech 2 is 20.5. Obviously, it's going to be in your best interest to aim for the Tech 2. We've got a Tech 2 armor or Tech 2 afterburner. The reason we use Tech 2 is because it's a little bit faster than Tech 1. It takes one more power grid. If you've got the power grid to spare, do it. It's worth it because... Uh, what I was saying before about scram kiting, to be able to effectively kite in any situation, you must be able to dictate range, which is to say you must control the range between you and your opponent. If you want the fight to happen at 7 kilometers, then you need the ability to force the fight to happen at 7 kilometers. The way you do this is by having an afterburner. You're probably going to overload it uh, because you can overload it for long enough to get your to get you through the fight, right? You may have to turn it on and off overload depending on how the heat's going for the fight. But if you see you're not maintaining, if you're not dictating and controlling the range and getting to the range that you want to be at, then you're going to need to overload it. Now, the other things that help you to dictate range are your web, which slows the target down. It affects the target by removing 55% of its velocity. So just to see what it does, we can put it on ourselves and see that our velocity changes down to 437 from 970. So that's what it'll do to your opponent as well. The warp scrambler turns off the micro warp drive of your opponent. So that means that if they are, there are many targets you will come across that are full kites, is what I call them, that are total kites. And what I mean by that is basically a condor or a kiting tristan. You'll also see um, the slicer, Imperial Navy slicer, which is my favorite ship to kill um, in faction warfare. I don't know why, it just is. But the Slicer, for example, and the Condor will both stay out at about 18 kilometers outside your web range, even overloaded. Overloaded your web goes to 13, overloaded your scram goes to almost 10. The Slicer and the Condor will stay out beyond your scram and web range, beyond your really effective DPS range, and they'll stay at range. Now what this means is that it's going to be very hard for you to do damage to them while they're still going to be able to do damage to you. Should you actually hurt them, it's going to be very easy for them to disengage and just warp away because they're faster than you. They have a micro warp drive. The warp scrambler prevents the micro warp drive from working. It shuts it off. So if you're sitting at the warp end of a faction warfare site, they have to land right on top of you. So before they land, you need to have your afterburner on. You need to have your drones out, and you need to be right ready to get your web and scram on. And as soon as they land, you hit approach, lock, approach, lock, approach, lock, until you, get the, until you see that you're approaching and until you see that you're locking. And when it starts to lock, go ahead and hit these modules and activate them before the lock goes off, before you get the lock, so that the moment you get that lock, you get scram web and stop them from getting out beyond your scram range. That's crucial. Now, the next thing to talk about is the guns. The guns are 125 rail guns. The reason we use rail guns instead of blasters is because we're trying, in many cases, not in all cases, to fight at roughly 
six to seven kilometers. Now I set my keep at to 6,750. That's what I set it to. I set my orbit to 500. The reason I have a short distance and a long distance is the keep at is for when I'm scram kiting. If I'm up against a blaster boat or a projectile turret, um, auto cannons. If I'm up against something with short range, then I will go to the keep at. If I'm up against something that's also a scram kite or something that's got long guns, like maybe I've tackled a slicer, Imperial Navy slicer, then what I will do is I will orbit at 500. One of the bonuses of this ship is that it has a tracking bonus. You have a 7.5% per level of Galante frigate tracking bonus. So what that means is that you track very well, even with rail guns. Rail guns don't track as well as blasters. But even with rail guns, you're going to be able to hit the target pretty well, even in close at 500. So I guess that means we need to talk a little bit about transversal. Transversal is, if you imagine yourself in a field with a bow and arrow and there's a rabbit running in circles around you, and you're trying to shoot the rabbit with a bow and arrow, right? The slower the rabbit moves, the easier it's going to be to hit it. The faster the rabbit is, the closer the rabbit is, the harder it's going to be to hit. Because the closer it is, the more speed, transversal speed it is, the more apparent the speed is. If it's at a distance, and maybe that, maybe some parts of that analogy don't work, but you get what I'm saying. The faster something's rotating around your ship, the harder it is for your guns to hit it. So this tracking bonus helps you to hit stuff even though you're doing that. And if, if you can make it a tracking war, and you'll see that against one of these... Uh, uh, I believe it's against this Incursus we're going to look at in a minute. If you can make it, or it might be the Tormentor, if you can make it a tracking war, then you're going to give yourself the advantage because you can win the tracking war and because most of your damage is coming from drones. Therefore, if you're missing some shots, and he's missing shots, but most of his damage is turrets and most of your damage is drones, then guess what? You win the fight because you're still doing more damage than he is. So by doing that, Orbit 500, keep at 6,750. The reason you do that is so that you have those two tactics ready to go. And different ships will call for different tactics. Slicer, Orbit 500. Um, Atron, keep at 6,750. And Cursus, keep at 6,750. So those are the things you want to know, but it's not, it's not hard and fast. And we're going to talk more about that with the cheat sheet and with other things. But for, for right now, those are the two things to, to take away from it that you have those two tactics, the Orbit 500, the Keep at 6,750. Now, with your rail guns, this is where you can save a lot of fitting space. So you can see I have down here, I have two rail guns open. Let's open the market group. These are all the rail guns. You've got your 75s, your 125s, your 150s. I would use 150s here, never going to fit. So what I use is the Tech 2. Why do I use the Tech 2? Well, let's let's look at the difference between Tech 2 and the next best. The next best is the pro, is the prototype Goss gun. Prototype Goss gun, you can see, gives you a very big edge on CPU. It saves you five CPU per gun. So if you're having any CPU issues fitting, do not be afraid to go to the prototype Goss gun because it's almost the same, very very similar and better in some cases. So side by side, here we go. Let's look at them. And side by side, it's going to look like the prototype's better than Tech 2, but it's not. And we'll talk about that in a second. So they both have the same volume, both the same capacity, hold the same amount of ammo. They both, ha and the Tech 1, the prototype, has a less of an activation cost. So it uses less capacitor. It takes less power grid. It takes less CPU. Same duration, same all this stuff. Everything else, damage range, all that's the same. Um, the only other thing that's different is that the Tech 1 puts off less heat and therefore can overload longer. And we'll talk about overloading in just a second too. There's a lot to cover here. So from this, it looks like they both do the same damage. They have the same range. So why would you use Tech 2 instead of Tech 1? When I could go to Tech 1 and then save enough power grid to get a better damage control, and thus improve my tank, the amount of DPS I can rep, as well as my overall effective hit points. And it's, it's a valid point. The reason is because I get a little bit more DPS out of the Tech 2s. And the reason for that's not really readily apparent until you look at the skills. Tech 2 weapons 
have a specialization skill. And the specialization skill allows you to, for every level trained, get an extra 2% damage bonus. So at level 5, which I have with this character, because he's, he's pretty specialized. Uh, that's all he really does is um, tech 1 frigate PvP. So he's trained to level 5, which takes some time. Getting it to level 3 and level 4 is not hard at all. But level 5 is going to be like a 2-week skill or something. But at level 5, that's an extra 10% damage output. So that's why I go with Tech 2 in this case. If you don't have tech the, the skills for it, or if you're only at like level 1 specialization, go with the 125s. Because the extra little 2% that you're going to get is not going to rival the amount of capacitor savings and fitting savings, which will allow you to fit stronger things. For example, I would strongly suggest if you can, the first thing you would want to upgrade would be the damage control to a Tech 2. The second thing would be a Tech 2 scram because it's going to give you an extra 0.7 kilometers of scram range. So do, don't be scared to use the prototype Goss guns, especially if you're wanting to keep this super cheap because they are dirt, dirt cheap. Um, I'm pretty sure that you can buy them for probably 20% the cost of the Tech 2. So those are your guns that you're going to use. Now, just as we overload our AAR for the entire fight, we're going to overload our railguns for the entire fight. The reason for that is because you can see I put a NAS in between them. We'll talk about that more in a second too. But I put a NAS in between the two guns. That acts as a heat sink. So when you overload modules, they get hot. And if they're right beside each other, they get hot faster. So by overloading... By setting both the guns at the edges of the rack, so by putting one at the start, one at the end, we get an advantage. And by putting something in between them, it could be an empty slot. It doesn't matter if it's a modular empty slot. But by having some uh, slot in between them, you're going to even further increase the amount of time that you can overload. This is the average. It's not a hard and fast number. There's some random variation. But roughly 2 minutes, 18 seconds, I can overload that. I can overload the AAR for roughly 18 minutes, which... You're never going to run it for that long. It'll run out after about, what, 40-something seconds. So with the guns, you want to overload them the entire fight. AR always overloaded. Whenever you're running it, you're overloading it. Now, by doing that, we increase our DPS. Because you're overloading your guns, you get extra DPS. When you compare this to something like the Incursus or the Atron, most of its damage comes from its guns. And it has three guns. Therefore, you can't overload nearly as long. But because you only have two, you can overload for pretty much the entire fight in most cases with no worries. You don't even really have to watch it if you have just the basic thermodynamic skill of like level three. And you could probably get away with just letting those overload from start to finish in the fight. And if you've watched my overloading video, which I highly recommend you do, then you know that it's always better to overload at the beginning of the fight than the end of the fight. A lot of people, when they come into PvP, think, oh, you overload when everything's going wrong and at the very end of the fight when you're desperately trying to save yourself. No. It's too late then. You've already lost. The fight's decided usually in the first 5 to 10 seconds of the fight. The rest of it is just execution and following along with what started. The first person to get DPS on target has an advantage. The per person who overloads the earliest has an advantage. Because it's better to overload at the beginning of the fight and then have to stop the overload later than it is to wait until you're five seconds from death and then start overloading. You want to get the maximum benefit for the maximum amount of time. All right, so this is what your real stats are. 113 rep, 153 firepower. You, you notice my rep's not permanent, but it doesn't matter. Minute 29 is more than enough to get you through the fight. For rigs, we have some pretty basic rigs. We've got an anti-explosive pump. That's just to fill our hole here. And we're going to talk about holes a little bit more when we talk about the Warrior 2s. But I have an anti-explosive pump because there is a low resist. Let's go ahead and get rid of this. So you see that my resist, these are how much damage they resist. So uh, this damage type, EM, thermal, kinetic, explosive, it's how much your armor naturally resists those damage. So... If you imagine an armor plate, like a steel plate, is going to do pretty well against a laser beam, right? But a steel plate's not going to do that well against an explosion if you're trying to pierce it, or a kinetic, you know, say, a bullet hitting it, right? 
uh, burning it was the thermal. So it's it's kind of logical, right? That a shield, an energy shield, is probably weak to energy, like lasers. Whereas a armor plate, armor, is kind of weak to explosions. So any ship that typically would run an armor repair, anything that has an armor repair is likely to have an explosive hole. Not always, certainly not. But especially at this level of PvP, you can assume that if they're running a small AAR in a frigate, they've got an armor hole. And we'll see more of that here in just a second. So we have that, that hole in our explosive resist for armor. So I want to plug that hole with a rig. And I use a small anti-EM pump. And that No, not EM. I was wondering why it didn't go up. I used the wrong one. Small anti-explosive pump. And that takes my resist up to 44, which is comparable with the rest of them. So if someone tries to uh, counter me or beat me by using what they assume is going to be my weakest resist, they're going to run into that, and that's going to make it harder for them to kill me. My next two rigs are the small auxiliary nano pumps. Now what these do is they give you a 15% more armor rep per cycle. There's also a nanobot accelerator which would give you a 15% decreased duration. Um, you could argue for both of them. I prefer the auxiliary nano pump simply for the reason that capacitors are already a little tight. You don't want to decrease your duration and therefore end up using more capacitor because if it's going off more often you're using more capacitor right two of those tech one's fine you don't need to worry about tech two um, there are some some cases where you might use tech two on a tech one frigate a tech two rig but in this case I don't think it's really worthwhile so now we're going to talk about the drones most people if they were fitting this they would say why aren't you using hobgoblins five hobgoblins will do more DPS so let's let's test that Okay, five hobgoblins, and you can see my DPS goes up to 120, 175, compared to 153. So on paper, right, from a very shallow look at these numbers, you could say that I would get an extra 22 DPS output if I were to go with the hobgoblins. But what it doesn't take into account is the damage type. So if you look at the drone information, the important thing to look at here is that hobgoblins do thermal damage. Warriors do explosive damage. And what were we just talking about here with our AAR? With our AAR, we're talking about the fact that for one, most of the ships you're going to come across in Faction Warfare outside of Kaldari ships. But if it's an Amar Tech 1 frigate or if it's a Galante Tech 1 frigate, the odds are, it's and even many of them in Matar, the odds are it's going to have an AAR and it's going to have an explosive hole in its armor. So if his main source of his tank is his armor repair and the weakest link or the weakest part of his armor repair weakest resist is his explosive resist and the majority of our DPS is drone DPS not to mention the warriors are faster and track better than hobgoblins we are much better off to run the warrior twos now I've done the numbers for this I've done the exact math and compared this across three or four different other opponents that I've fought um, in faction warfare and in each and every case the Warrior 2s do more effective damage than Hobgoblin 2s to a ship that uses a ancillary armor repair. So an Amar Galante, typically. That's why we use Warrior 2s. Now, I want to vary. That's, that's basically all we're going to talk about for the fitting. I suppose we should talk about implants. Um, but we're going to show you these other ships here in a second, the opponents that I've fought. So for implants, I like to keep it really cheap. You're in a Tech 1 frigate. You don't want to spend a bunch of money on implants. So what I typically go with is I'll typically go with implants that 
are less than a million, two million ISK. So you can see here I have an RS603. That's usually about a million ISK. What it does is it gives you 3% more armor repair. So you see 113, 110. Now the other option there is you could go with a you could go with a SH603, which an SH603 is going to give you 3% more turret DPS, which in a lot of cases is good. But keep in mind, you've only got 57.9, let's call it 58, turret DPS overloaded. An extra 3% to 58, that's like less than 2, like 1.8 or something, I don't know but less than two extra damage per second. It's not really all that effective. Um, it's better to stay alive in this ship. So I went with the RS-603. The EM-701, again, about a million ISK, it gives you 1% more agility to help you to maintain that range that you want to maintain with scram kiting. The 803 gives you 3% more structure hit points. So if you see your EHP here, it's 3312. Without it, it's 3264. <clears throat> what you're going to run into a lot in this ship, in fights you have, is that you're going to be bleeding into structure. Um, just a second, I got a call. You're going to be bleeding into structure. And if you're bleeding into structure, then the more structure you have, the more armor you have, the more time you have to get your reps off. Because you're going to find that a lot of times you're dying faster than you can get your repairs in. Maybe you could have tanked that DPS for a while, but because it's a high amount of damage all at once, a high alpha, then you're having trouble tanking it. So having a little bit more structure down here is going to help you to absorb that initial DPS, and it's going to keep you alive long enough to make sure your AAR can keep going. I've got a repair efficiency 901. Again, you could go with a surgical strike 901 and get an extra 1% for your guns, but in this case, a little bit more tanks better. And finally, there's a 1001, HD 1001, which gives you 1% more armor. All of these implants are very, very small advantages. But you add them all up, and it gives you an edge, which might mean winning or losing a fight. Because so many of these fights end up being very close. The final suggestion is Synth Exile Booster. This is going to give you a further 3% armor repair. This is a, it's called a drug or a combat booster, and it has no side effects. The skills to use it are minimal, 1% biology. Um, don't worry about affecting skills, doesn't matter. 1% biology. So I would get biology level 3 at least, so you get more duration out of it. But by running the Synth Exile plus your other implants for armor repair, we're getting a total of 7% more armor repair, which in this case is probably about 8, 7 or 8 more DPS tank. Very small edge, but it helps. All right, so now we're going to start moving more into tactics. I'm going to talk a little bit about tactics here in this window, and then we'll go to a, a more dedicated tactics video after this. So, no, not that one. Okay, so this is, well, I meant to talk about this before. This is if you use the Tech 1s. So if you had to use the Tech 1 guns, you could fit a Tech 2 damage control. And you can see that when we give it all the same advantages here, DPS is 5 less DPS, cap stability is slightly better, um, and hit points is also slightly better. So this is not a bad alternative to that, but that's not what we're looking at right now. So... This is kind of like you, what you would expect from an Incursus that you would fight. Not exactly, but pretty close. So, best case scenario, he's using Null, but he's probably not. Most likely, he would be using Antimatter. And so you can see here with the Antimatter, his optimal is 1.1. That means the range of his guns before their damage starts to decrease is 1.1. His falloff is 3.1. So when you add the two together, you get 4.2. Anything beyond 4.2 kilometers and his blasters are pretty much ineffective, not doing much at all. By staying out against this ship, you would keep at 6.75K or keep at 6,750 meters. By doing that, you would avoid just about all of his DPS. Now, I want to show you a guy I fought the other night 
And I beat him the first time I fought him, and then the second time I fought him, I lost because I didn't turn on my AR early enough, and therefore he was able to do a lot of damage. Now, his fit is actually very good for an Atron. And you can see he has less tank than me, but he has pretty good damage output. No drones, okay. Pretty good damage output, especially up close if he's using... Count Arianta Matter. He's got really nice damage output, and even with Null, which is probably what he was using in the fight, he's got pretty good damage output. So what you can see here is, because he's an Atron rather than a Tristan, he can dictate range. He controls the range because he's faster, 1382, 970. We both have the Scram Web. He's going to control the range. So most likely he is going to load the Antimatter to get the maximum DPS, and he's going to come up and sit right on top of you and do the maximum of his damage. He's going to be overloading. And so he's going to be doing all that damage. You're only repping about half of it. In that case, the best thing you can do is overload your afterburner and try to stay away from him for as long as possible. By doing that, you're going to give yourself the best edge. Now, what we were talking about before with the, the Warrior 2s, you can see right here that his explosive resist is only 23 compared to his thermal resist of 44. Hobgoblins would be having to fight that 44, whereas Warrior 2s are going to be landing most of their DPS um, straight through his armor and thus doing quite a bit more than his armor repair can hold. Finally, I want to show you this guy that I fought last night and show you his fit. So this is a Tormentor. You will see Tormentors quite a bit. But again, he has a small armor repair. He's got an explosive hole. Not as big of an explosive hole, only 42.9 compared to 53. But he's still got an explosive hole. The important thing to keep in mind here, that you're going to see some in the cheat sheet, is that he has beam, la beam lasers. So what you'll see in the combat videos is you'll see I'm act actively looking at my damage notifications. up. They're up in this area of your screen, the top, middle. And if I see that he's a beam laser setup, as opposed to pulse lasers, if it was pulse, I would continue to keep at 6.75. But whenever you see beam, whenever you see rail, these are the, the guns that are longer range, you don't really have an advantage staying at range. And you're better off going in at 500. So what I did with this guy is I was fighting him, and I think I have the video, so we'll probably see the video. I was fighting him, and I was staying out at range. But then I saw that he had beam lasers, and I realized that it would be much more in my it would be much more advantageous to me to go in at 500 and orbit this guy close so that he starts missing some of his shots. You can see that his DPS is pretty much all from his guns, 162 compared to 39 drone DPS. So by going in close and orbiting at 500, I was able to avoid quite a bit of his beam laser DPS. Plus, I was doing explosive damage with my Warriors, which was really eating into his armor repair and making it harder for him to repair me. Now, this is a good fit. This is a good fit for a, uh, for a Tormentor. Um, but this Tristan's better. And the reason is because you're flexible. You can do the Orbit 500 or you can do the Key Bat. You can maximize Transversal and make it a, make it a tracking war, which you're going to win. Or you can maximize range and make it a range war which you're going to win yeah, depending on the target you're going to see more of that in the cheat sheet that's it for the fitting part of this video next up we will talk a little bit more about tactics but basically the same things we've already talked about in just a more illustrative way